basically like moving chess. There's like a lot of like little intricacies that kind of get overlooked until you start playing the game and you're like, oh, you almost get this like ah moment. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. My name is Nick. In this episode, we're going to look at a sport we have all played, but is now skyrocketing in popularity. Our guest is one of, if not the best in the world at tag. This is four-time World Chase Tag Champion, Rob Schill. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. Let's start with the basics. What is Chase Tag? Chase Tag, uh, so essentially Chase Tag is you got two teams. Um, the game itself is played essentially just like regular tag. So when you come down to the court, it gets a little bit different. Um, instead of it just being kind of like a random uh go anywhere you want you're confined to a 40 by 40 arena uh the arena has a lot of obstacles and things like metal and wood um and then the other kind of twist is you're running away from uh professional parkour athletes track and field athletes there's a uh, football players you're playing a 1v1 tag you have a six person team so once one of the we'll say rounds ends you will swap out with one of your next teammates and uh, if you succeed in that 20 seconds of evading or getting away, you uh, you stay on the court. So it turns into this kind of this cardio game and um, has a lot of little little intricacies and layers to it that can kind of add to why you'd put someone up against another person. So you have like pairing methods and things like that. But essentially it comes down to uh, it's just a game of tag. Can't leave the arena. I was looked, watching some of it. And I mean, this is kind of a gross approximation but it essentially looks like tag on playground equipment yeah i mean it's like playground equipment with no nothing soft and so even the ground is uh usually laid on top of like just like poured concrete and so no part of it is soft <laughs> the, it seems like you, you get injured do people get injured it looks like people are going to get injured yeah people get injured um here and there a lot of people that train it so for like me and uh, the parkour space a lot of us train falls and had to uh, essentially take those impacts but there's still the tendon tendency to like you'll get a, a head bump on like a metal rail when they're trying to like duck really quickly underneath something so you'll get like little bumps and like head bashes like like that um but honestly a lot of, a lot of it comes down to just uh, the individual and how they practice so for our teams We've done a lot of uh, ukemi, which is just like the art of falling. So we, we have a tendency to try to like take a fall or take like a, a dive and then turn it into a little bit more of like a, like we call it quadrupedal movement, where you're on your hands and feet, you have rolls, different things like that. So you have, you have some ways to combat if like a slip or fall happens. Um, but yeah, most of the athletes are pretty good at taking falls and bashes and yeah, you see, you see a few of them come up into competitions. So where is this? I'll ask this directly, right? Like, where is this in terms of sports development? Is this an organized sport where people have strategies and training sessions and that kind of thing, or is this like this is? It's a bunch of people on the weekends kind of doing this stuff. It's a it's transformed quite a bit into that competitive scene where there's like a lot of like little intricacies that kind of get overlooked until you start playing the game and you're like, oh. You almost get this like ah moment when you start to realize that it's not just like you go out there and you just chase. Um, that was kind of like one of the things that really captured me was I was I was interested in chase tag, but it wasn't until I played it that I had that ah moment and was like, oh wow, there's like it's basically like moving chess. Like you have like physical, it's like physical chess to a certain extent where you understand like that person's body type. Um, you can if you have information on the team you can kind of tell that like, oh, I can tell that this person doesn't like this part of the court. Like they're a taller person. Um, they are going to have a harder time crawling underneath these obstacles or they're maybe not the fastest athlete, but they're like really good at scrambling on the floor. So then you can almost like hit the opposite side of the spectrum where they, they really like that tight area, those tight spaces, and they're going to like avoid the like runways that are on the court. So ultimately, you're trying to corner somebody with like a scouting report of the person. Like, okay, they're tall. They probably don't want to. I want to force them into a small space or whatever, right? Is that how kind of how it works? A lot of the like where you try to corner someone might be a little bit more on the person that's doing the cornering. Like they might have their preference on how they approach that side of the court. 
Um, if you know someone is weak on a certain side of the court, you might want to try to herd them over there. But most often it's like catered towards uh, the chaser and like how they they personally like to try to tag. So like there's certain parts of the court that I'm like, I, if I can get them here and I'm positioned in this spot, I almost I'm certain I can get a tag. And so it kind of comes down to like, okay, well, how do I get myself into that position and make sure that the opponent is also in the position I want them to be? Is one accepted as being harder than the other? Like is being chased harder than being the chaser or vice versa? So when we're training in my backyard, um, we have the whole, the, the actual quad back there. Um, there's a lot of times where I will only practice chasing. Um, and then there's times where I only practice evading. Um, and a lot of times the, the reason I'll choose to be most often a chaser is I get to control the pace of the round. Um, when you're evading, a lot of times you you can try to control the pace of the round, but you just end up always having this like lizard brain moment where just like your eyes turn red. You're like, Oh God, I got to get out. And you just start sprinting through. So chasing is like, for me, I, I definitely prefer chasing evading is uh, something I also really enjoy, but like chasing, I really like, cause I can kind of pick the pace of the round. What you prefer is 20 seconds. I think you mentioned 20 seconds. Is that a long time or yeah, man, that goes quick. Oh, it feels like forever. <laughs> uh, it, you can like, We'll call them interactions. So if you imagine like one opponent coming close to another opponent, uh, in that 20 seconds, you can sometimes see like up to like five interactions where you'll see them meet on one side of the quad and then they'll run to the other side of the quad and there's just this constant, um, not constant, but just like a, a ton of interactions that will get happen uh, that'll start happening. Uh, so like back in our backyard, we would yell, I don't know why, but we would yell wallaby as like our, our finishing timer, like wallaby, wallaby, get off the court. Like it's, <laughs> you've been running for 30 seconds. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times, like, you'll be running for that 20 seconds and you're like waiting and you're like, oh, it, oh, it's a little bit longer than expected. And it, yeah, it, 20 seconds lasts a really long yeah, it time. It doesn't seem like that long. But then I think if I'm dead sprinting, like, that's a long time. <laughs> Dude, yeah, it catches up fast. Only thing I can compare it to is I used to run the 200 meter in track and, like, man, I'm still running. Like, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. And especially if it's like your second round, too, like, it just starts to add up you start to like have a hard time picking up your legs and in order for you to be a evader, you have to have gotten the tag. So that usually means you have already spent at least like 10 to 20 seconds on the quad already sprinting. So whenever you see someone get an evasion, it's usually a pretty big deal because that person usually is a little bit fried. Yeah. I would imagine like if you escape once, you're probably not escaping the second time because you're just so physically tired. Yeah, you know, that depends on how the person runs you too. So there's a certain, it's like one of our strategies is if you don't feel like you can get the tag or you can't, like, you just don't feel like that that's going to be reasonable. Your goal is just to like run them as hard as you can and just like try to keep that person moving, keep that person sprinting. So then the next round is like a higher opportunity of essentially tagging that person. That makes sense, right? Wear them into the ground so the next guy can get them. Does the strategy usually work out though? About 10 seconds into the match, all chaos will generally break out unless you've been training a lot. So our team is pretty well known for uh, just like our strategies and how we approach the quad throughout the whole time. We we generally will keep the same strategy throughout the whole match. Um, there's a lot of other teams I'll see that sometimes they will start out with like amazing starts, really good reactions. And then once like the play starting and they're starting to run. It's almost like a chicken with their head cut off. And it, it just kind of comes to like being able to keep your cool after the first couple interactions um, and keeping your eyes on your opponent. I think that might also be a big piece is after people have trained a couple of interactions, they go to another part of the quad and they're now like focusing more on just like their breath and their energy. And they forget to kind of look, um, which will cause them to get caught out of position. So I'm a big numbers person. So like out of every round how often does somebody get caught how often does somebody evade i think it's 24 percent is what they want for the tag ratio so uh ideally 24 percent of the runs there'll be a tag and they want to they want to keep that number about around there because if it gets too high then you lose the i guess like the crowd joy or like the like like, oh, that was the play, like, to, like, rewind on. Um, so, like, if there's tags happening or evasions happening, like, almost every round, 
then it almost loses its like uh, fizzazz in that. So the 24% is about a good number for keeping it like where you're on the edge of your seat, you're not seeing tags happen every round. And then when you do see it, it's like this like big moment and you're like, oh my God, that just happened. He just like dove over the space and you see like body noodling over. So then how do they control? They just make the equipment different? That's kind of how the quad is developed. So they, they started the quad off um, with not as much equipment as that's on it now. Their kind of rule of thumb is that they'll they'll only add, they won't remove unless like they really, it really came down to them having to remove something. But every every year they'll pretty much like add another bar or they'll add another like cross section that will kind of cater back to that that play percentage so like if there is a map like a not a match um a comp that has like higher higher evasion ratings then they're gonna try to add some bars and to try to create that that ideal percentage which they actually did for <laughs> they actually for for our team specifically they like added in some bars and they called them the like fu apex bars because <laughs> we would run around behind the the court in this one position and they didn't like that. <laughs> now, how did you get? How did you get into it? Uh, so I've been in parkour for quite some time. Um, I've been training parkour since about 2009. Um, been doing national competitions for speed parkour and skill parkour. Uh, there's a few different divisions in there. So you got like style, you got speed, and you got um, skill, which is essentially like bits and parts of like a obstacle course. Like so, like you have like a specific jump that you have to accomplish and then like a speed course will be like a whole series of different types of challenges all back to back kind of like you'd see um and just kind of like a race but it's just basically a time trials and then there's another one that's a style which is like a little bit more um free based where you can add in flips twists you're not trying to get to a specific spot um some comps will have you go to certain checkpoints but mostly it's like on your execution of flips and speed or uh, execution of those flips. Um, and then for me to get into the chase tag, we ended up it was during COVID, uh, not a lot was happening. And then uh, the, the the brothers, Damien and Christian, who run World Chase Tag out in London, they were they had a really hard time getting all, able to do like a, a, a competition because all the borders were closed down. So it was more realistic for them to come to the US to where all the states could at least could you could fly between the states but you couldn't fly from like germany to france and it was a lot more difficult for them to run it out there so 2020 they brought it to the us they kind of sent out like a a request to all the different parkour athletes and gym owners and stuff like that to see like hey we're bringing world chase tag to the us can you guys put together a team and so two months before the comp uh we all kind of came together with our masks on we're like hey is this going to be something we want to do um, we all agreed that it would be fun. It would be something different. We t- didn't have this opportunity in the past. And so we, uh, we just kind of jumped on it and started training for it and then went to Georgia and had a great time. So how popular would you say it is now? Uh, it's quite popular. Um, it's on YouTube it was, uh, it was a few million hits on each, each of the videos. Uh, the most recent competitions have been picking up like, so we originally picked up by like NBC for the first competition. The second competition was picked up by ESPN. And then the next following comps were kind of uh, sponsored by that or push, put together by the ESPN group. And then uh, this last this last comp, that was just at, I wasn't competing, but I was just there to kind of spectate and uh, help out. And uh, it was at the like Arnold uh, event where Arnold Schwarzenegger runs like this like huge event where there's like more sports than the Olympics. So we had this like really good position in this area where like a lot of people were able to walk through, come check it out. Arnold Schwarzenegger came and like watched a few matches and he was like chanting and like going like, yeah, and, like beating his hands on the table. It was really, really fun to watch. But yeah, it's been, uh, it's been picking up a lot over the years. Would you, yeah. can, is there anybody making it a full-time living? Any athlete, I should say, making it a full-time living? Not yet. But still, I mean, once, I feel like once you hit the kind of TV level, and it's not three o'clock in the morning on the Ocho, so to speak. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's picking up in popularity. Now, for for most people who participate in it, do they fit a certain characteristic? Like, are they mostly parkour athletes? They come from all kinds of backgrounds. Mostly, like the, anyone who's like really fast. So, like track and field athletes. Um, I've been seeing a lot of track and athlete, track and field athletes, kind of. Uh, pick it up really easily 
but it's mostly parkour athletes um, because of the element of falling. Um, there's just a lot of like diving through bars and like being able to kind of like fumble through that. Parkour athletes have the most background in that that style of movement where you're jumping and also trying to like look at someone else. So parkour is definitely the the biggest pull um, for all the athletes. What essentially makes somebody good at it, right? Like, is it better to be fast? Is it better to be strong, agile? Like, what kind of physical characteristics does somebody need? Ideally, you would have a balance, um, but speed is like a huge element. So if you have speed, you can sometimes lean into that and kind of forego um, a lot of strategy. But if you're going against someone that has a lot of strategy, then they can use your speed against you. But I would say that speed is like probably the biggest skill that you'd not skill, but uh, talent that you'd want to have. So speed and then probably like crawling, being able to crawl, like be able to do that effectively. So a lot of the parkour QM movements um, and then speed can translate to you jumping on top of things, but then you'd want to be able to have accuracy because like you're stepping on like a two inch bar and so you want to be able to like, if you are fast, you should be able to at least be accurate with those steps. So that's just kind of a little bit, that's something that's like very different from track and field. Um, just take some time to kind of apply that speed onto like very narrow objects. Cool. Um, are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Yeah. Throw them at me. Is there cheating? No, no cheating. There's a lot of a lot of really good uh, camaraderie between the athletes. Like if you notice, if you ever watch the rounds, you'll see they'll be like really angry doing the run. And then the second the tag happens, they're like hugging and they're like commending each other on the, whatever happened during that match. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like one of the cooler parts about the sport is like most of us are parkour athletes that have known each other for mul multiple years. And then even if you don't know that person, there's just like this sense of like, we're here, we're doing this together. We're, we're pushing the sport it's uh it's really nice does the clothing count like if you get somebody's clothes but not necessarily their body <laughs> so there's a lot of each comp will kind of change a little bit on that um but the like there's there's this like if you wear a hat and it falls off uh technically if they tag the hat then that counts as a tag that counts as a tag so like if you're running yep so if you have any kind of clothing that falls off that counts yeah, because that would be the only thing that I could see some disagreement. It'd be somebody being like, "Hey, I got you." No, you didn't. Like, I didn't feel it. Like, is does that does that ever happen if you like get the clothes or something? We're like, "I got you." I didn't feel it. Yeah. So if it if it comes up on camera, so they'll call like a DTR, which just allows you to stop the match, and then they'll like pull up the camera footage, and then if like if you are catching their clothing and it's like a obvious tag, then they'll they'll give that tag out. But if it's like sketchy, you can't really see what's going on. One person saying they felt it, the other person saying they're not, they'll always go to the tag has to be made obvious. So if it's not obvious enough, then that's kind of a direction they'll lean. But there's been a lot of times where like like uh, this last tournament, I saw one of the guys like just like straight grab the shirt and hold on to it just like to ensure that he showed that he made contact. Put all humbleness aside here. Who's the best? Oh, us all right but you guys are the champions right or were the champions correct me here fill in the tell me the resume we're the current world champions so uh, we've gone through four different comps uh there's the atlanta georgia one then there was one in ohio then there was one in texas and then there was the one in london london was the worlds for uh i was last year and so we went out there for the london competition and uh it was was not easy but we did come back with the with the gold we had two teams go out there and so we had one team come back with third and then the other team um, our team came back with first so what makes you guys better like could you say like oh we beat this team because of this i would say a large component is for years we've been training uh, speed parkour so we've run lots of competitions where we focus on speed and then that translated into chase tag pretty fast and then I think the major thing that really started to differentiate us was we started to apply a lot of our speed training into very specific motions on the quad. And so our tactics is uh, something that I would say is the biggest helper, the biggest thing that kind of helped us kind of claim those golds and wins. Do you, do you feel like you can stay on top or once the other teams kind of figure out what you guys have been doing, are they going to 
bridge the gap? We'll see. Uh, we'll see what, what happens at this next uh, competition, but I believe that we'll still be able to kind of pull through and kind of keep that push of our, our strategies. Um, we haven't seen a lot of other teams fully get into that space where they're focusing on those different strategies within the quad. Um, so I think that this next year we're, we'll still be good. Um, but it's, a uh, it's not, it's not easy. Everyone is now starting to get more and more, uh, quads out. So like out in Europe, I think there's like five quads. And so we're now competing against people that also have the quads and it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a, a really fun competition because now it's going to be people that are all training different tactics. It's going to be fun to see just that element of chess where you're like, Oh, I've, I've seen your training footage. I know that you like to do this. And so trying to like take I guess like the information game into the the next rounds will be fun. Okay. Again, putting humbleness aside though, who would you say, if it's you, say it's you. Who's the the best? Like if you put it down to one person. Ooh, the best person? That would be one of the guys on our team. His name is Jason. He's like this monster. Uh he he can like sprint on top of the bars and he can like crawl. Uh we call it QMing. He can QM faster than almost like anyone I've ever seen. It's like almost bizarre to watch him just like sprint touch the ground and be like back up into a sprinting position um hands down i'd say jason's like one of the best athletes and then the next person up would be a. I would probably go with seth or jared luddy so seth wang is uh one of the guys on our team and then jared luddy is a guy that we picked up recently and brought onto the team and uh between all those guys like we just have like one of the fastest also one of the most committed teams to getting a tag so a lot of a lot of teams have a hard time committing to like a dive and like jared luddy like there's like pictures of him going for a dive and he's like diving through bars that are like he's like five feet up in the air and he's like a straight pistol like little straight sticks shooting straight out of this thing and it's like absolutely wild to watch this guy like get back to his feet from like any of these dives is it a sport though where you can be good through reckless abandon like if you're just willing to sacrifice your body you will be good at this you won't be good at it for long <laughs> so if you if you are doing that there's it it like your it, all the injuries will stack up very fast and so there's like a, a couple of players out in the uk that have been known for just like sending these ridiculous dives and they like basically crumple like an accordion when they hit the border and like that's something that like we we try to avoid we don't want to be injured for any of the comps um so if you're aware of people who are sending it and like are like really reckless you just have to be aware of that and then you can still bait that stuff so like if you know that they're more of a diving athlete it's pretty easy to combat so recklessness can be beneficial but if your team is aware of you being a little bit more reckless then it probably won't help you that much. But okay, let's say I'm a numbers person, like I mentioned earlier. One is like, I'm yep. not doing anything but walking here. And 10 is like, oh my gosh, man, you got to get this under control. Like, where do you need to be in the scheme of like being kind of pushing it a little bit where you've got to do something that maybe scares you a little bit versus reeling it back in? Like on a scale of one to 10, where would you say that people should be to be successful um you should be able to move in that range or in that scale so kind of like the the speed gradient of like you you don't want to chase too fast because that person will get out you'll, you'll see you and cut back same thing with like your commitment if you're like too committed on things then it will kind of pull you back so i'd say that like you'd probably want to be like running at about a six and then as like the interactions start to like pick up, you'd want to move it up to about like a seven. And then when it comes to like, you know that that tag is coming in and you, you feel it's clear, like you should push it up to that nine and feel pretty comfortable going for it. Um, fear isn't exactly something that crosses your mind when you're playing chase tag. I think a lot of that comes down to like before the game or like even when you're practicing. But like when you're playing, it's like crazy how your lizard brain takes over you stop thinking about everything and you're just, I don't know, it's like this crazy flow state that you get into when you're playing the game. So can, on that scale, I'd say you'd want to ride it around like a six and then ramp it up to about a nine and be able to be able to almost like turn that brain off and like trust your training and uh, be able to react for falls. 
Is it harder though than it, is it harder or easier than it looks? It's really, it's a lot harder than it looks because until you've been on the quad and you like get stuck behind equipment, you sometimes don't understand how hard it is to tag someone when they're like five inches away from you. Um, there's sometimes like, you'll be like watching it and you're like, Oh, why didn't they just like tag them there? And it's like funny how when you're like standing up in order to like, say you're on top of equipment and there's someone right next to you on the floor, you have to like squat down to tag them and you can't squat faster than gravity. And so there's a lot of times where like, you're really close, but it's like almost impossible to tag them still. So there's a lot of times where when you're watching, it's hard to understand those little pieces or just the element of like, if you're trying to reach through something, your body's going to be touching like very hard steel. So I think that is like one of the bigger shocks when people like get onto the quad, they're like, Oh, this isn't soft foam noodles. Like this is like hard steel that like you're like, playing around. So I think that's the hardest part is like the size trying to like actually understand the size of the quad when you're watching it. And then actually recognizing like how hard it is to commit to a tag when you're in the midst of those runs. Oh, for the team, when you're talking about a team competition, is it better to have a good chaser or a good evader? Uh, so that was one of our main focuses going into the last comps was we want a team of really good chasers. We don't really, we didn't care too much about evading. Um, that kind of came secondary. And so we, we kind of leaned into our previous chase or uh, our speed parkour training for that side but put most of our focus into like really good tagging. We figured if we had really a team of solid taggers that there's almost no one that could like beat that. So we focused on the initial before the later. And then, um, yeah, the evading kind of some of our people on our team are just like really good at evading. And, uh, that's one of those pieces that just kind of, we, we didn't practice as much. We just focused a lot on the chasing elements. That makes sense even to somebody who knows nothing about it, like myself, right? Like if it's harder to chase somebody, you'd rather have that. And then the evading seems like that would just come along with it. And then the way, the way the scores work as well, like you can't, you can't evade unless you tag. And so that was kind of the, the stacking of that. And so we're, we were just focused a lot more on, really good tagging techniques and just uh we'd call them traps where you have like basically and you can't get out of it where you have them tra trapped in the corner and you've got a way of kind of bouncing back and forth and you're constantly getting closer but they're not getting an opportunity to get out so we call those traps where you've got someone stuck in the corner and they can't get out and so and if you have got a really good trap and you know how to trap, then you can probably identify when someone's doing traps to you. So that, that also kind it of It really happens. does sound like athletic chess. Like you got you're trying to catch you're yeah. trying to catch the king and you gotta position the other stuff to catch the king. Um Yep. What country, maybe not the best because you guys are the champions, but what country would you say like this is the most popular in this country? Um uh, this team blacklist from France. They're absolutely cr like bonkers on the quad. Um, they've been they've been coached by one of the founders of parkour, Sebastian Focon, and so they have a really good team dynamic. Um, and then one of the other teams is Fat Team Fat from um, I guess that'd be they're kind of a little bit all over, but they're they're from London, um, and they've got just like these like young gun kids that are just absolutely crazy athletes, and so. They don't train too much of chase tag, but they train a lot of parkour and that correlates really, really well into it. And so that was one of our biggest competitors at the last competition was this, this team called Team Fat, where they're just like crazy fast athletes that have very good perception to the sides. Like they can be doing a challenge, but also be like fixated and looking at you while they're doing like this, like massive jump and precision. Um, so yeah, that would say that the blacklist guys and team fat are some of the biggest competitors. What animal would be best at this sport? Ooh, best animal. That's a tough one. I want to say a monkey, but monkeys are not fast. Oh, that's right. I don't think a monkey would do good at it. Um, probably like a cat of some sort. So maybe like a, like a, jaguar or like a le like a leopard something that can like because like those things can climb trees too and take falls so i would imagine 
those things coming around the quad and being able to crawl underneath and like have that speed probably be pretty scary i have like a small dog and we would ch- we would chase her around on the quad and she would run around underneath all the bars and stuff and we have like a small cat that would also play with her and so we had like a dog and a cat playing around on the quad and watching the cat move is uh yeah i think that the cats would have a little bit more advantage that's what i was originally thinking would be like one of those little lemur monkeys but then once you started talking i thought maybe mountain mm-hmm. li- like a mountain lion that would be scary as hell yeah like a bobcat <laughs> yeah Ooh. <laughs> there's the next evolution of it man <laughs> there's the next evolution of world chase tag just unleashing a bobcat into the quad <laughs> just everybody run for their lives um that's pretty much all the questions i got man what's kind of coming up next for you uh it's coming up next is uh we're trying to get our quad that's in my backyard right now and try to get that indoors so that's kind of one of the main things that we're trying to get get done over this next year so we can prepare for the next worlds which will be in october so we'll be going to london um we'll be starting to gear up for that here soon but uh yeah we're, we're mostly trying to get get some property and get get that thing underneath the roof where do you feel like you peaked elementary middle or high school like which one of those was probably suited you best I, I guess I'll just say high school. I feel like I probably peaked in high school, though. I I would say as a as a as a man, I probably peaked around twenty seven. That seems like kind of early for a man to peak. I think that you really want to peak probably in your forties would be the goal. Forties or fifties, I think, is when you want to peak as a person, and then you can ride that peak down into your sunset years. Elementary school doesn't count, so that gets thrown out the window. Maybe you peak in junior, junior high if you have to pick one of those three uh, options. But I, I don't think so. I think high school because you're getting, you know, you're you're in that that stage where you're probably dating somebody or having fun, um, whether you're into sports or into the chess club, you know. But uh, you, you're just you're just creating your own identity. I think that's very important. I think middle school were my best years. I would say that's where like I was the p- most at home was in middle school, right? Like you got some responsibility, but you don't really have a lot of responsibility. You can kind of still be a kid. It's not those goofy years where you're just freshman and sophomore in high school. I'm going to say seventh grade was probably my best place. Like if I had to go back to school years, I would go back to seventh grade. Uh, no, I mean, if I had to go back for, I'd go back to my junior year, I think, of high school. That was yeah, probably my... That's a good year, too. Yeah. I think most people will tell you maybe their freshman or sophomore year they peak. I think your junior year is when you're, you know, because then after you're like, oh, hell, I have one year of school left, and then who knows what's going to happen. I would say if it was high school, I probably peaked my June, in between my junior and senior year that summer. I would look back on the summer between junior and senior year as probably the best year. Like, ooh, that's a good year for you. Uh, I have another question for you. This is a listener-submitted question from Christian. And it's one of those things that I think that you react immediately in a certain way to it, and then you think about it, and it becomes a much better question. If you were to draw a picture of fire, what color would you make the fire? Would you make it red or would you make it orange? I mean, my, my, I mean, I, I kind of, if you hadn't prefaced it with what you said about reacting one way, I, I would have just said red. That's so immediately what I picture fire as. If I was going to draw a picture of fire, it would be red. Although in my mind, I do think of it as orange. But I wouldn't color it orange. I would color it red even though I think of it as orange. This all stems to the Sun comment on the top five last week, which there was a lot of people who had a lot of opinions, uh, and apparently a lot of our listeners that I'm going to offend right now, I'm sorry for that, uh, are scientists and are sunologists. Um, The sun is yellow. Get over it. The sun is not yellow. The sun is white. You could literally Google it right now, and the first answer that comes up when you Google what color is the sun is white. I am always fascinated by the number of people who comment on things. Not 
related to our posts because we don't usually post kind of that kind of stuff. But the number of people who comment on things when a simple two-second Google search would have showed that they were completely <laughs> wrong, right? I mean, but I'm prepared to go down on the ship. I understand. Like, I get it that the, the sun is actually not yellow, but in my mind, it's yellow. Do you get in arguments with people online? No, and actually, um, I don't think I ever have. I've always stayed away from it. Maybe it's because of being in the media myself and knowing that it, it doesn't matter. If someone is taking the time to criticize or ridicule or just uh, troll you, then it doesn't matter. They want you to respond. I'm a fan of a good trolling if it's kind of an obvious trolling and can be funny to people. I'm just fascinated at people who just like comment like wrong. Uh, on occasion, when I do respond to things and I do it on my phone, there I'll misspell something and it'll just be completely wrong and I won't catch it. Oh, that's and the then worst. somebody will be like, "Oh, you don't know the difference between they there and they are." Like it's uh, well, you got me, even though it's spell check's fault. I do hate it when that happens to me, but I do like to point it out to other people. <laughs> it's like an automatic win card. If somebody spells Stop. their wrong, it's just like you automatically, whatever their argument could possibly be. You could be arguing with the head of NASA about space, but if they use the wrong there, like you have won that argument. It really is a drop the mic game over moment. If you... It's game over. Grammar is yeah. game over. All right. Let's give, uh, speaking of grammar, let's give some shout outs, shall we? Uh, we'll, we'll start off with the easy and easy one here. Noah Hale. Appreciate you. I was almost named Noah. My mom almost named me Noah. Oh, well, that's great, uh, I guess. Uh, Clark Now Ellis. you know a. <laughs> now you know a that. Oh, boy. Uh, Mar <laughs> Mar it's Mar setting in. It's it setting is. in. <laughs> and everyone out there is like, why, why are we listening to this? Uh, Marcus Orlesian. Uh, Blaze. Marcus Maron. is my son's middle name. Marcus is my youngest son's middle name. All right, well, I almost got through two names. Let's see if I can tie in all the shout-outs to somehow being about me. You're, you're not going to. I get, this next one, you won't be able to. You ready? All right, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Hyera Charlotte. I once drove through Charlotte, Illinois, or Charlotte, North Carolina. Been to Charlotte, great city. Keep them coming. I love how we just, just rip these names apart. These are actual people that listen and follow. Uh, all and right. we thank and appreciate them very much. We do. <laughs> yeah. We really appreciate anybody who I mean, listens. Listen, I always you, try to respond to people. Lydia Sutton. Hmm. Lydia. Lydia Sutton. Lydia. I don't personally know anyone named Lydia or Sutton. I know a I knew I know two Suttons and I know a Lydia. So I'll carry us on that one. I don't actually know two people who are not related that have the same last name. Like I don't know two different Smiths or two different people with the same last name that are not related. Oh man, I. I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, I, I know several Andersons that aren't related. I know uh, a couple of, uh, surprisingly enough, Bruce's with the last name of Bruce that are, are not related. Um, Johnson's another one. I don't know anybody. I can't think of a single two people I know that have the same last name but aren't related. I can't think of a single person. Not even like a Smith or a Roberts or a other really common last names. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, let's try. I let's you try. Knew so many people. Let's try this one. Uh, Grant Sandberg. I do know two people. I know two Thomases. I know a Logan Thomas and a Reuben Thomas who are not related. Sorry, I ran over that shout out. Yeah, okay, I was fine. really excited. Grant Sandberg, Aubrey Dowless, Isaac Cronkies, and uh, just for you, we're going to end on another Noah. Noah Caraliz. Okay, so Grant is my brother-in-law's last name. What was the other ones? I'm trying to make these uh, all about me. Let's see. We had a uh, Isaac. 
Isaac was a good friend of mine who passed away from cancer recently. Well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that. And then we uh, ended we ended on a, another Noah. Again, I was almost named Noah, um, but my mom thought it was too bad because people would say, "Do you know a Vinzant?" She was like, "No, ugh, ugh." <laughs> <laughs> Nicely um, done. Nicely done. You. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> I actually just made that up. I'm, you know what? I was told this past that was weekend. Good. That was good. That was good. That I should try out for uh, like an open mic night. That I would be funny, this person thinks. Hmm. Would you have the courage to do that, though? You know, I I, I think I would. However, I think I would not be funny at all. Because th- in my opinion... Like, I think I'm a pretty witty, smart guy around my friends, around coworkers. But getting up in front of, and I'll be liberal here, you know, 50 people, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think it's just, it's very hard. It's a lot harder than I think comedians get the credit for. Would you be more comfortable with people you knew in the audience or go to like a different city and do it? I think if, uh, you know, I, I fall into the trap. I'm, I'm kind of making this a long answer, so I'm sorry. But I I, uh, I fall into the trap of if my friends are near, you tell stories just about you and your friends. And other people mm-hmm. may not find those funny. I think I'd rather try just in a, a group of random people first. Yeah, you should go try it. Just go out into the boonies of Michigan. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see how you handle these uh, these bangers that I have for you here. Uh, okay. When you become an old man, an old crusty Vinzant, which one of these would you rather have? Thugly teeth, hairy ears, or super bushy eyebrows? Hairy ears, because I can easily just trim that stuff up. And I generally see my ears every day. So I would go with hairy ears. What would you do? I think I just do the bushy eyebrows. I mean, I kind of have them now to a certain degree. I mean, I, I, it'd be no different. Seem, it seems easier, though, to trim up ears than it would be to trim up eyebrows. A little bit riskier. I mean... You make a mistake with those eyebrows, man. You could be looking pretty strange. It's fairly easy to trim your ears up, man. You just get one of those trimmers. Just brruh, brruh. Ha, have you ever... I mean, have you ever seen... Nope. Yeah, well, it's not that easy. I mean, the hair grows in the ear. It grows, obviously, in the outer part of the ear. It's... It sucks. It's not. Do you have does, to trim your ears? No, but my grandfather does, and <laughs> his hair, his ear hair, gets even worse because he has hearing aids. So, like, then the hair has nowhere to go, so it'll just become like a gigantic ball behind his Ooh, hearing. Aid. Yeah, I don't want to think of. Have you trimmed his ears for him? I have not. No, I, I have. I have not. Let's 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 move on. Let's, All right, let's, good. Well, yeah, let's move yeah. on. All you young people, that's what you have to look forward to. Um, as as great as as that is. Uh, all right, so uh, kind of going along with our top five, which we'll get to obviously in a, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, would say you're on the playground. Would okay. you Would you rather have been the and maybe you were one of these the first kid picked or the last kid picked for a game? Well, I think you'd rather be the first kid picked because the last kid picked is usually, you know, not just a reflection of their athletic ability, but you're probably not like even getting like a courtesy pick, which I think that I, I was generally picked like maybe second or between second and fifth, but I think some of that was like a courtesy pick. What, why a courtesy pick? Well, I was like friends with the team captain, right? It's like, <laughs> oh, well, get him. At least I mean, he's not, he's... He might not be as good as that other kid, but like, we, well, like, we like that kid, right? Like, so why would you want? Why would you not want to be picked first? Why would you want to be picked last? I, I mean, I sometimes being sometimes when you don't look the part and you're picked last and you just dominate everybody, it's the it's the greatest feeling. You want to talk about peaking as a child? That's a peaking moment right there. Were you picked last a lot? Only for the athletic sports. <laughs> does it haunt? Does it still haunt you to this day? Uh, no, no. The only thing that actually it doesn't haunt me. No. One thing that bothers me is I, I always like to play basketball. But if you know me, you know that I, I I 
don't have a basketball body at all. I'm like a pair. Uh, I've gained weight over the years, like whatever. So I would always get picked. No, no matter, even if I was in shape or, or was a good football player or whatever at the time, I would always get picked last because I'm not very tall and I'm not, you know, I just don't look like a basketball player. But man, if I got on the court, I was throwing elbows and I was taking shots. You're in trouble. Yeah. So it's if I made a shot, you know, the thing is, is I, you know, I played the part of the clown because obviously that's probably what I was to most of those those people playing basketball. Um, I would say something, but I mean, I feel like that was a genuine moment of reflection and you know some childhood <laughs> trauma that was coming up. All right, let's see what the masses picked for us today. Oh boy, it's a tie. All right, well let's uh, let's get these two out of the way. So uh, on our Twitter page, every uh, I like every... how you take whatever the people have picked and say, "Let's get it out of the way." I think we could have a little bit more respect to our listeners. Well, there's four choices, and you can vote. Uh, usually, go up on Mondays when we record this. And uh, let's see. Uh, the one thing I really wanted to talk about didn't win, which was the seaweed blob that's heading for Florida. Apparently, it's like a five mile wide. Uh, layer of seaweed that's just coming for the coast of Florida. Uh, let's see. Uh, one of the things that did win, were you a Good Burger fan growing up? I only remember the line, Welcome to Good Burger, Home of the Good Burger. But I have never seen that movie, nor had any desire to ever see that movie. At well, no point in my mind did I ever think, I'm going to watch Good Burger. But I well, may have missed something that wasn't of my generation. I think I was like aging out of that phase. Well, now you can uh, you can you can watch the first and the sequel. Good Burger Two is uh, going to be on Paramount Plus probably in the next uh, I don't know two three years, however long it takes. I will say this: looking up, uh, who is it? Um, Keenan Thompson and Kel Mitchell. Keenan Thompson definitely got the better end of that career. I think. There's always, whenever there's a group, there's always one that gets the better end of the career. You can see that from, like, I think it was called Keenan and Kel, the two of them. You can see it in Flight of the Concords. Even, yeah. like, Key and Peel. <laughs> one, one person always does a little bit better. Key and Peel are probably the two that, are like, oh, they're the most, they're the closest, where both of them have been pretty successful. Like Simon and Garfunkel, man. Paul Simon went way ahead. Garfunkel <laughs> dropped off the map. Very, there's always one that does a lot better. Very rarely do they have comparable careers after they split up. Like Casey and JoJo. What happened to either of those guys? Um, who? Who? Casey and JoJo? Got it. Uh, all right. Well, uh, what one? Uh, who or, were Casey or, and JoJo? Wait, wait. What was Casey and JoJo? Uh, late '90s, they had a song called "All My Life." It was played everywhere for about a year and a half. Okay, it's just not where I was living. Yeah, <laughs> does not surprise me. A lot of cows where you live. Um, all right, so uh, the other topic that won. Uh, so Miami Beach spring break. Yeah. Apparently, Miami Beach wants to cancel spring break because of all the hooligans that have happened down there. And just and we're just starting spring break. It goes from like now until obviously the, the middle of April. Uh, they've had two fatal shootings, uh, looting, uh, rioty crowds. Um, so beyond that, because, you know, people who listen to us know we don't get too serious. Um, what's what's the best place you've ever spring spring break at? Spring I've never at. done it. Spring broke? I don't know. Spring broke at, I think. <laughs> I think he would say spring broke at. I have never gone on a spring break trip. I never went on one. Anything that was kind of the thing that everybody did was always things that I didn't do. And that surprises nobody that you would say that. Once, once everybody's talking about something and doing something, then I just kind of lose interest in it. It's like the movie Avatar or Titanic. <laughs> Once something becomes really, or Ted Laszlo, Laszlo, whatever his name is, once something becomes really popular, I just, I lose all interest in it. Uh, Lasso, by the way, and that's a fantastic show. Not, I'm not going to say it's one of the greatest I've ever seen, like others uh, have or will, but it's 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 worth a watch, and it's not it's half an hour episodes. It's good. Not watching it. Not I, interested. Not no, going to do I, it. I know you won't, but it's you know whatever. 
Can we move on to our top five now? I don't feel bad for any of those kind of places that advertise things. Like, you don't get to pick and choose what you get. If you want to be a tourist destination, you can't say, hey, everybody come for this. I wait, wait, but you don't come. Mm-hmm. Nope. It's either all or nothing. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Are you ready for our top five? <laughs> I wasn't going to contribute your old man rant anymore there. Um, okay, so our top five is top five childhood games. What's your number five? Man, and there's so many, by the there's way. There's a lot. These. Um, so I know I'm going to miss some, but uh, I'm going to start off my number five with Capture the Flag. Mm. The only thing I would have against Capture the Flag is it was usually too hard of a game to organize. Like, it took a little bit more involvement than I was generally willing to put in to play Capture the Flag because you needed to have, like, the right geographic location. You needed to have a number of people. You needed to have something that was like a flag. I enjoyed that game when playing it, but it was not a frequently played game. What's your number five? Sharks and Minnows. (laughs) Okay. I love Sharks and Minnows. Sharks and Minnows was a great time. Everybody likes Sharks and Minnows. I I have to tell you, I'm not that versed in Sharks and Minnows. Do you want to explain a little bit of what it is? I th- Sharks and Minnows could be one of those games that other people call it something else. Sharks and Minnows was the pool game where you had to like get from one side to the other. Oh, right. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. What did you call it? I don't, I don't recall calling it anything. It was just, hey, you try to get to this side or I'm going to tackle your ass in the water. Maybe elbow you in the face, Ryan. Mm, I do have a friend of a, a friend of mine, Jason Valentine. We once played sharks and minnows, and we played for way too long. And he was standing outside for two hours with his back turned to the sun, and he burned quite badly. <laughs> he never came over. Like poor Jason well, Valentine, yeah, and his sorry. head was shaped like a block, called a blockhead. Jason, Redman. the blockhead Jason Valentine. Valentine. Yep. Um, uh, what's right, number so- four? So this this might be this is a personal favorite of mine, but uh, musical chairs, but not like little kid musical chairs. I remember playing musical chairs maybe in the sixth seventh grade, where you are going at it with other kids trying to get you know on the chairs. I mean, you're tackling, you're hitting, you're punching. So you know, I'm I'm gonna say like middle school uh, musical chairs. I was more of a fan of Duck Duck Goose. Than musical chairs. So if I had, that's why I didn't put musical chairs on my list because if I had a choice between musical chairs and Duck Duck Goose, I was going to go with Duck Duck Goose because you always had that one kid that you could just really whack on the head, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right? looking you're at like, Goose, wham! Oh, yeah. that was you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Or, hey, Shul, do the rope climb. And the PE teacher knew I wasn't going to be able to get off the ground and he still did it anyways, so. Yeah, well, you, you seem like you were tormented as yeah, a child. Fucking shitbird that guy was. Anyways. My number four is Freeze Tag. In my opinion, the best of the tag-related games is Freeze Tag. So I actually, I don't have tag on my list. Um, not on my top five. I could see that. I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put tag above third, honestly. It's I a feel good like... game, but it's a little simple. Well, and I feel like it's it's one of those games where it's fun for about five minutes, and then you know the fast kid is going to win every time. Yeah, that was the difficulty. There was always a certain kid that was going to win. Yeah. It's, there wasn't a lot of, like, it's not mixing it up there. What's your number three, then? So uh, we're going to go into the pool for this one. Marco Polo. Mm, I have Marco Polo higher on the list. I think Marco Polo is a little bit better of a game than where you have it at number three. Okay. My number three is hide and seek. Okay. Great that's... game, but great game, but can wear on you pretty quickly. Uh, so that that was a that was another game that I was like, is it top five? It's yeah, what like kind of what you said. It wears on you and before you know it, it's like, meh. You go hide. I'm never gonna find you. I'm just gonna go, you know, eat something. <laughs> the only thing, the only, the only thing that I wonder about hide and seek is that if we weren't parents, if we would have put hide and seek a little bit higher, because I've played hide and seek with both of my two children, 
which generally consists of me just standing obviously behind a small tree and waiting 20 minutes for them to find me. So my enthusiasm for hide-and-seek has been tampered down more than potentially other people who are not parents. So that would be a question to the audience. That's funny. What's your number two? Uh, Parachute. What fancy school did you go to where you had parachute? I didn't go to a Rich fancy kid. I went to a public school just like right with parachutes. Okay, first off, uh, if if you don't know what the, what the game is, it's literally just a gigantic I know what the game is. It's just a giant sheet that you flip in the air and you try to either get under it or get out of it before it comes down. It's it's just fun. I, I don't know how else yeah. to explain it. I wish I lived in a place that had sheets. Okay. Had a parachute at my school. Okay. Actually, I do think I remember playing that. Yeah, and I do fun. remember actually it being kind of fun. Yeah, it's very fun. Marco Polo is my number two. Oh, okay, huh? I think Marco Polo is the best water-based game. I would, yeah, I would absolutely agree with you on that. Plus, it was just so much fun to be right next to the person and say, you know, Polo. Uh, or hear Polo, and then you just turn around and just, you know. <laughs> what was your uh, go-to strategy for Marco Polo? Uh, well, uh, I was a bigger kid, and water didn't treat me very well. So I would usually just... <laughs> this whole know. episode is rough for you. <laughs> I I don't know how else to say this other than, um, you know, you have your eyes closed, obviously. You say Marco, they say Polo. And as soon as I would hear Polo, I would just jump in that direction and hopefully land on somebody. What's your number one then? Uh, horse. The basketball game? Yeah. Horse or lightning, either one. I, I prefer lightning, but I think horse is more it's it's more universally played. What's lightning? You're just you know, you're at the free throw line or wherever wherever little kids shoot baskets and then you know, you have one person shoot and then the other person shoots behind them, and if they oh. make it in before that, before the kid in front, the kid in front's out. And then, you know, it kind of just keeps Ooh. going. Oh, we played lightning. We call that 20. We call that knockout. Oh, yeah. Lightning. It's not really horse, but, you know, I'm going to say lightning as my number one. I remember that being such a fun game to play. That is a fun game. I especially liked it when you didn't shoot the ball. You just like the person who would shoot the ball and you just throw your ball into their ball and like knock it way out of there. Such a or like use your ball to hit their ball out of the that's strategy is what that's called. My number one is dodgeball. Okay, so I mean I left off kickball, I left off dodgeball, uh, just because I didn't know if you were gonna be a dick and be like, oh, but those are kind of adult games and blah blah blah. Well, I mean I think I feel like horse is a little bit of more of an adult game than dodgeball is. Uh, I mean, maybe, but that's why I changed it to lightning. Okay. What do you have in your honorable mention? I have a bunch. I've yeah, seen. so a lot of them we've already, I mean, freeze tag. I have, uh, uh, like, bags. Or I don't think it's called cornhole when you're a kid, but we called the bags growing up. Uh, duck, duck, goose, red light, green light. Red light, green light. That's a, that's a, that's um, one that I could put up there pretty high. Red light, green light was pretty solid. Hopscotch, uh, no. uh, uh, crack the can, hide and seek. I don't know what that is. Steal the bacon, uh, but I think we didn't call it steal the bacon. I think we called like grab the dollar or something. What's steal so. the bacon? So essentially, it's kind of you know how the best way I can describe it to make it make sense easily is you know how when you're playing dodgeball, you have both teams line it, they they line up on one side and then there's the balls in the middle. Well, yeah. Steal the bacon or get the dollar is there's an item in the middle. And, you know, instead of everybody running, you designate like two people, you know, one person from each team to go. And then, you know, after each team's gone, whoever has the most dollars or the most objects wins. Hmm. You have to okay. be quick, which is obviously why I, I didn't win a whole lot at that game. Uh, my honorable mention ones you didn't mention. Um, Red Rover, which basically just ended up to people running into each other. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever played Red Rover. Red Rover, Red Rover, send somebody right over, and you got to try to run through 
a bunch of people holding hands. I don't know if you can still do that in today's school. It's actually like kind of a violent game. That like even yeah. kids who like violent games are like, I don't know if I want to play that. That gets pretty <laughs> intense because you're yeah, basically trying so, to though. run people over. Um, we called it crack the whip. Oh, what's that? That's where you like run around in a circle all holding hands, and then whoever can no longer hold on gets tossed into the oblivion, and then you just keep going. Oh like it creates God. a lot of like, I don't know, G force tension or whatever the right phrase would be. The only other one that I'm surprised we didn't have on there <laughs> was Simon Says, which yeah, to me but... is I don't like that game. I've never enjoyed Simon Says. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't recall playing it as a kid. I mean, I went to a very nice private elementary school. All I did was play parachute the entire time. Uh-huh.